uh, chapter number, verse number five, when it talks about the name that's in her forehead, the first word is actually mystery. Do you see that? And I, th- I thought about that one. Notice the use of all caps. Boy, when God, when God does that in the Word of God, and by the way, it's translated correctly. They put these in all caps. When it's done that way, you had better pay attention to what it said. It's like the word Lord. You can capital L, little O-R-D, or you can have it capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It changes the meaning completely. But that name... Now we're talking about the uh, religious system. Again, the, this is reversed. And I'll deal with that in just a few minutes. Chapter number 13, they dealt with the political system first, then the religious system. But when you get to the chronology of the Bible, they put the religious system first. Why? Because that's what started the political system. They are tied together. But he uses that word, the Holy Spirit of God, used the word mystery. When you find a mystery in the Bible, it's something in the Bible that can only be spiritually discerned. In other words, people that are not saved out here, when they read this, they will have absolutely no comprehension of what God's talking about. The Bible talks about the mystery of iniquity. That's first, second Thessalonians chapter number two. The Bible talks about the mystery of godliness. You've got the mystery of the church. You've got the body of Christ. You've got these things that people don't understand. So when he put that name on there in her forehead, It just simply means that only God's children can fully understand the meaning or the ramifications of what we're going to be dealing with tonight. For this cause we set forth the Bible, truth concerning the mystery of the religious world. The world believes that we're hard-hearted, we're hateful people, we're narrow-minded tonight, we're judgmental tonight. Uh, what I'm going to preach again tonight, if you put that out over the air, you've got a lot of people that are not going to like it. They're not going to like it because, folks, they don't understand it. So it does seem like it's hard-hearted and narrow-minded and all these things. It sounds that way to them. But I want you to understand, this is God that put this in here again. This is not me. This is not my Bible. This is not His, my Word. It's His Word. So God is stating a full-mentioned principle of Bible interpretation on the end-time religious system when you get to chapter number 17. The child of God clearly sees. By the way, this is my writing. I just sat down and wrote it. The child of God can clearly see the spiritual truth set forth by the Holy Ghost in the Bible through revelation of the Holy Spirit of God on the inside. Now, the mystery of both Babylon the Great and the Great Whore. This mystery has blinded the minds of those that do not understand. You know, the Bible talks about the God of this world that blinded their minds. We live in a day of blindness. You think across this nation night, and I don't want to get political tonight, but you think that people can look around and say, hey, this don't work. <laughs> and it just, it doesn't work. And yet, they're perfectly good with it. Last night, we haven't been getting our mail but about every other day out on Rabin Road. Listen, anybody else having that problem? The mail office down here, listen, they cannot get people to run these routes. They pay 20 something dollars an hour. Plus they pay for your vehicle. They pay for your gas. They pay for the wear and the tear and the tires and the oil changes and all these things that, hey, I'm talking about paying, that's a pretty good lick. I don't know how many of you make $25 an hour or so, but that's not a bad lick out here. So last night I went out in my pajamas for about the fourth time to check because you never know when they're going to run. So here I am in my pajamas, all the neighbors out in the next yard. I've got pretty pajamas. I'm not ashamed of them. I walked out in my t-shirt and my PJs and I went up there and I stood and they looked at me and I looked at them. About that time, one of these little mail, you know the mail vehicles they have here in town, the regular mail, here it came flying down that road and went past us. My neighbor said 7 o'clock on a Saturday night. He went down, put a box in a mailbox and came flying back by. And I'm standing there to, and I said, do you have any for me? He said, I'm not delivering mail. He said, I'm just delivering boxes. Boy, it, it was a black man. He was hot. 
He said, we can't get anybody to work. Said a lady today's worked for the mail office over 20 years. Said she walked in, said I ain't working today and turned around and went home. And they're shorthanded. They've got nobody to run these routes. Now, what I'm saying is, you look around today across America, these people don't even think it's broke. Now, let's go back to a spiritual thing. The Word of God is spiritually discerned. The Bible talks about the natural man. He cannot understand it. Neither can he know it because it's spiritually discerned. So what we're saying tonight is something that God says, not what we think. And I want you to understand, and if they're listening tonight, the problem is not with this pulpit. The problem is not with this Bible. The problem is that you need to get saved and get the Spirit of God, and then you'll be able to discern what the Word of God says. So we find spiritual blindness. Now, what I want to get into this, we find further clarification of one, who... And then what the end time religious system will be. Mystery, Babylon the Great. Now I'm going to break it off of that. Reason being, I'm going to deal with the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth next week. There's a lot in that statement, all right? We're we're going to bring the uh, end time church from its beginning, its inception down to where we are. Now when he talks about Babylon tonight, you need to understand again, there have been only seven world empires. Talking about world empires. These are empires that ruled the known world completely. We have not had one since that seventh one. The first one you had was Babel. It's found over in the book of Genesis. They were the first congregating of the world at that point in time, all of the same language, and here they, they started. The second one was Assyria. The third one was Egypt. The fourth one was Babylon. The fifth one was Medo-Persia. The sixth one was uh, Greece under Alexander the Great. And the last was the Roman Empire, which has not gone away. Now... We're going to bring things spiritually and, and uh, from the head down tonight just a little bit. If you look under C, if you look back to verse number 3, we find where the great whore will sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads, ten horns. I've kind of dealt with them right there, the seven heads, seven powers. These seven heads begin with Babel. They come down. It was a Nimrod. We find that in Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. The Bible said, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And Eric and Akkad and Calneth in the land of Shinar. Now what they did... The whole world had congregated together. We're talking about after the flood as men began to replenish the earth. People began to be born again. And then they all gathered together and they started this religious system. We find under three the word Babel comes from the Hebrew root word. and It just simply means confusion. Now, you don't need Hebrew and you don't need Greek tonight. But I just wanted to understand what the word Babel actually means because the Bible said that he confused their languages. It was in that land of Shinar that the Tower of Babel was built. I put in there Genesis 11, 1 through 4, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. They said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach up unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, if we went back to the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel, what they are doing, they're literally quoting what Satan said. Satan said, I will ascend to the uh, throne of the Most High. He said he'd exalt himself above that throne. He said he'd have a name that would be above God's over there. And that's the same thing. So what we have here is a religious system that is anti-God. Now, God went down at Babel. He did confound the language of the earth. 
But what, what made this first power stand out in world history is it was the first organized rebellion against God. Now, prior to this, you had individuals that had uh, turned against God. It started out with a man by the name of Cain. Then you can go on up through Genesis chapter 6 and through the flood and because of the evil of men. Uh, God destroyed this earth. He started all over. And guess what? The rebellion started almost immediately within the house of Noah. Again, those that were on that ark, we have no idea if any of them other than Noah was spiritually saved. You hear people preach the ark a type of salvation. The ark is not a type of salvation. Noah was not saved by building an ark. And his wife and children and their wives were not saved by getting into the ark. They were physically saved. That's why when you get to the New Testament, the Bible said that Noah moved with fear to the saving of his household. It was a physical salvation. I don't believe that everybody that died in the flood was lost. Did you read what we read again? If, uh, let me just go back and read tonight. We started with this verse. In verse number 18 of chapter 68, the book of Psalms, Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast get received gifts for men. You find that quoted in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, you find an addition to that. Listen to the rest of it. Yea, for the rebellious also that the Lord God might dwell among them. When you get to the book of Peter, the Bible said that he ascended into the bowels of the earth and that he preached to the spirits in prison. Now that word prison doesn't mean that they're incarcerated like the jail. He used the word he led captivity. What's prison? It means to be in captive, all right? That's what they were in Abraham's bosom. They were there. They couldn't get out. They didn't want out. I, I certainly understand that. But when he ascended in, he brought captivity. That was Abraham's bosom captive. In other words, they didn't have any choice in the matter. When the rapture of the church takes place, you and I that are saved have no choice in the matter. It's already sealed. We're going home, folks. And he took them out, but he said those spirits were those that were disobedient in the days when the ark was a preparing. You can look up that terminology. I don't believe that everybody, they were the sons of God. They weren't angels. They were the messianic line that began to mingle with the daughters of men. That was the line of Cain. So you had the messianic line through which Christ came. Then you had the line of Cain, which was an ungodly line. And these children of God started looking on these women of the world, and they began to intermingle and marry in there. That's why he said that Noah was just. That means he saved and upright in his generations. He married right. But when we get back over to the book of Revelation, I, I, I want to get back to Babel. Uh, didn't want, if you're not careful, you give too much history in here. But God confounded that language. There's only one language. Matter of fact, He didn't make different languages. He confounded one language. Did you know if you study languages, every language in the world goes back to a single language? You study that out. The, the word mother is found in almost every language on this earth. It goes back to exactly the same thing. He confused a single language. And then they began to speak different languages off of one language. That's what the book of Genesis teaches. Now, he said the middle or the fourth power was Babylon. When we get to the book of Daniel, in a few minutes we're going to read out that because that's important. Daniel's prophecy ties in with the book of Revelation. Now, where was Daniel incarcerated? He was incarcerated in Babylon, folks. Babylon is an extension of Babel. So you had three world powers. You had uh, Babel in the beginning. You had Assyria. You had Egypt. Then you go into Babylon where Daniel was. That's why when Daniel shows this great image, and we're going to look at it in a few minutes, he said the head is Babylon. And he walks you right down through the rest of these world powers in that image. So I don't want to get ahead of myself tonight, 
But the seventh and last of the world powers was Rome. The first, middle, and last of the world powers being the same. Babel, Babylon, and Rome. These three are tied together. And we're going to see the tie in a few minutes. What makes this Babylon the Great? Why do they call this end time religious system Babylon the Great? Because that's where the foundation is. I don't think I'm going to take a night and get into what's called the Babylonian Mysteries but there's a lot of things today that we celebrate in the United States that were come out of what's called the Babylonian mysteries. There was a rabbit that came down from heaven that laid golden eggs. You've got all types of stuff in what they call the Yule tie, uh, logs and all this. These are out of what they call the Babylonian mysteries. And no, I'm not against uh, Eastern Christmas. <laughs> all right. But I'm just letting you know that we've got a big carryover that goes all the way back to the plains of Shinar tonight that is in this religious system. So we find these ten crowns on the head will be the revived Roman Empire or Babylon or Babel itself. Now, under D, that word mystery, secret, mystery, though through the idea of silence imposed by initiation into religious rites, uh, Years ago, before I was saved, I went into the Masonic Lodge. I was one of the officers in the lodge. You couldn't tell anybody what went on in the lodge. If you've ever been, I'm not going to ask you if you've ever been in the lodge. I was in the lodge. Uh, when I got saved, I never went back to the lodge. The Spirit of God spoke to my heart, and I, I left the lodge immediately when I got saved. I'd never heard anybody preach anything about it or anything else. But I recognized through the Spirit of God that some of the things being done in there, such as swearing on the Bible by blood and all these were not biblical things. So I, I just, as a newborn Christian, I just backed off. Don't want to get into that tonight. But I, I just want you to understand that we kept secrets from everybody. I came home one day with a black foot. And Barbara was curious as to why one bottom of one of my feet was dirty and the other one was clean. Well, I told her, I can't tell you why. It's a great big secret. It's a big boys club, all right? You say, well, what's the difference between a third degree master mason and a shrine or a 32nd degree mason? We, as third degree masons, used to call shriners drunk masons. So we, listen, there's a lot of jokes that they made in the middle of this. And by the way, if anybody wants to understand or wants to know what the Bible says about the lodge, I can tell you real quick, I was in that thing. And God took me out. I paid a price for that because everybody in my family were in the lodge, men and women. They'd been in there for generations. But God took me out of there one day, and I thank God for that. But what we did, we kept secrets that were imposed until you were initiated into those religious rites. So that's what he's talking about here. These are mysteries that are not understood until you get saved. I call them family secrets. I had a man one night, and I'm not knocking other denominations, but he, he asked me, he said, why do you believe in eternal life? And I said, because the Bible says we have eternal life. He said, well, show it to me. I took him through Scripture, Scripture, Scripture. Boy, we went all the way through the Bible. And he said, I don't understand that. And I had time. I was, I was starting a new business and didn't have a whole lot of uh, clientele at that particular time. I took him through it again. Finally, he said, I still don't understand that. And I just grinned at him and I said, do you know why? He said, why? I said, it's a family secret. Amen. <laughs> Well, you've got people that believe they can lose their salvation in the family. Amen. So I'm not complaining about them, but I'm saying that's the use of that word mystery. In 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 13 through 17, I'm just going to pull this out. He said this, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving being deceived. You find deception. God sends delusion in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We find in 2 Timothy. When you find a second or third of a book, 1 Timothy deals with doctrine. 2 Timothy and 3 Timothy deal with the, the, the conditions around the second coming of Christ. All right? They are prophetic in nature. They apply to that time, but they're prophetic in nature. Now, 
deceiving relates to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 9. Those who follow this anti-Bible, anti-God religion in the end time, listen, they have no Bible comprehension. It's hard to explain the Bible to somebody who is tied up in the system. What you have to do is share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Let God deal with their heart. Let them get saved and then let God bring them out of the system. All right. If you start talking about the system, then you're going to draw some fire. And I'm not out to do that tonight, but I'm going to preach what I've got on here. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come and friend they're here. Now here's the end system. What is it producing? Here's the product of it. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Notice verse 5. Now here's what they've got. They've got a form of godliness. You know, religious people can be good people. They can have some morals about them. They can and still not be saved. It's not their goodness or ours that gets us to heaven. I've seen some lost people that live actually a cleaner life than a lot of saved people do. They've got what we call old-fashioned scruples. They were raised in old-fashioned homes to where they're just some things that you did and you did not do. But look at verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. What's the power thereof? He lists what they're like. The power thereof is the power of the gospel to change your life. And such were some of you, he said in another place. But then he said, from such, he said, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Under two, they're being deceived, relates to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. This speaks of the knowledge in its upper echelon. There are those who know and understand exactly who and what this religious system is comprised of from the beginning to the end. I do not think for one moment that religious leaders of the great horde do not know exactly what the system is and teaches, friend. And this is the ultimate deception. While they are deceiving others, they are being deceived. The ultimate deception is simply this. I believe the, se- the worst deception is always self-deception. Second Timothy chapter 3 said this. Now as Janus and Jambres, that was the two magicians you find in Exodus. God gives their names here. Withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. They resist the truth. They have the truth. They know the truth. But they resist its teachings. He said, They're men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no farther, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Now, Paul ended the chapter with an admonition to God's people. That's to you and I who know and study the Bible. He said over in another place that we are to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is our admonition in the last days. What are we to do? Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I thank God for people that have taught down through the ages, stayed with the doctrines of the Word of God, have passed it on to you and I. We have a heritage tonight. I thank God for these old men. I spoke this morning of Dr. John Waters, good man. He preached, I think they began faith about the same time they began Tabernacle, about 1950, somewhere in that area. He paid a tremendous price for coming out of the Southern Baptist Convention. They beat him to death for that. I mean, he paid a price for doing that. But what these men did, listen, they have paved a path that you and I now follow. We're walking in their footsteps. That's what he's talking about here. Look at verse 15. And that from a child 
Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, what he's talking about in verse 15 is not original manuscripts. I hope you get that. Timothy did not have the original manuscripts. He had the preserved Word of God that God labeled as Holy Scripture. Now, God refers to that in verse 16. All Scripture, which goes back to verse number 15, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Why have we got a Bible tonight in our hand that we... Listen, it's this Bible that holds us fast. It is a, it's an anchor in the shifting sands of human theology. Theology is changing. Theology should never change. Theos is God and ology of knowledge and all knowledge of, of God comes from the Word of God. What, everything you and I know about God comes out of here other than what we call natural revelation. You can stand out under the stars. They declare the glory of God. The firmament is handiwork. But they don't tell you about Jesus Christ. That's the importance of what we got. Now, what I want to do, we're going to do this and we're going to finish. We're, I'm going to take you back just for a few moments to Daniel. When you tie the book of Daniel with Revelation, it explains things. Daniel was a closed book until the end time. It was a book they didn't understand. When Nebuchadnezzar had this great vision, all right, Daniel chapter 2, let's just slowly read down through because it's going to take you from the fourth world power. That fourth world power was Babylon. That's why Daniel didn't say anything about Babel. He didn't say anything about Assyria. He said nothing about Egypt. He took you from his day, the fourth world power, he said, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. And thou sawest till the stone that was cut out without hands, he's talking about Christ now, which smote the image upon his feet. That's the end time religious church that were of iron and clay and break them in pieces. Look at verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold. Now, broken to pieces together. Why? Wow, this system is one. If you destroy the foundations, let's take you back to a biblical truth tonight. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? How do you destroy people's faith? You destroy the foundation upon which the faith is built. If you can get somebody to start shaking at the foundation. Back in Kentucky, we lived in mining country. There was a lot of underground mining, a lot of strip mining. We used a lot of powder Boy, those explosions outside and inside, they shook that ground. And what happened with all these houses, the brick homes started getting cracks all the way down their walls and the cracks, uh, fall, the, the bricks falling off of the houses. If you went down in Barbara's stepdad's basement, there was a two inch gap between the wall and the basement floor and you can see down into the ground where it had separated it. Just, you, you wouldn't even think of it on the outside, just a, just a constant shaking, a pounding of that as they set off explosives after explosives. What happened is the house is not coming down from the top. The house is falling apart from the foundation. Now, that's what he's talking about here. With that stone, Jesus Christ cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors 
and the wind carried them away and there was no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain filled the whole earth. Now he's talking about Christ. Now we're going to end with this in Daniel chapter 2 verse 36 and follow. He gives the interpretation of what he just said. He told him what the image was and what the dream was. When you get to Daniel 2, this is the dream. Now, we are prophetically going to look from Daniel's day down to our day. We will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowl of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee the ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Now, when he looked at that image, that head was Nebuchadnezzar who ruled Babylon. The head's always been Babylon. The head was Babel. Now in the fourth empire, we find that he got his power from the original world power. All of these powers are tied together. But notice what he said. He said, Thou, the head is of gold, thou art this head. Look at verse 39. After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, but that second kingdom actually destroyed Babylon. If you, if you study history, Babylon had a wall so high and so wide that they could have chariot races on top of the walls. It was an impregnable fortress is what it was. But they had a river that ran underneath the walls of the city. And that's, that's where they got their water from. That city was many miles square. It was a huge place. And what happened when the Medo-Persian Empire began to attack them, they, they laid siege against them. But as long as they could get water, they could survive because they could plant things, they could raise things within the city itself. So what they did, the Medo-Persian Empire began to dig a canal off to the side. The people at Babylon didn't know. You remember when Belshazzar got drunk? God said, this night your life's going to be required of thee. What happened was during the night when they had that canal cut, they diverted that water. You ever seen a, a grist mill beside of a river? What they do is they, they cut a stream around that operates the grist mill. That's basically what they did. So during the night, they began to push rock and dirt into that river, diverting that water out of that river into that canal and taking it out around the city. And that night, they went under the walls. And where they could not breach the walls, they went under the walls and they destroyed the city of Babylon. And then you have the Medo-Persian Empire that took place. That's the one he's talking about here. He said it in verse 39, After thee shall rise a kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. That was Greece under a man by the name of Alexander the Great. How many have heard of Alexander the Great? One of the greatest military minds. He died in his 30s. He sat, he sat down finally on a, a mountainside and looked out over a city they had conquered and he said, I have no more worlds to conquer. Some say he died in a drunken brawl. I don't know how he died, but he died in his 30s. But they were swift. He was that swift he-goat. Uh, that you find in another one of the prophecies. Boy, hey, what a tremendous army he had. They could move with tremendous speeds. They conquered the whole world. So you had Babylon. That's an extension. You had Medo-Persia. Now you've got Greece. Now let's go about a little bit farther. Look at verse number 40. And the fourth kingdom, that's the last one, shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Now, you find Rome in verse number 39. What is the fourth from Daniel? That fourth one from Daniel is Rome. It's the last of your world empires. 
Rome stood for hundreds of years and finally fell through internal decay and plus the Huns and you had the Goths and the Visgoths and all these attacking from the north. You had people coming across from Africa. They just kept nibbling at them. They died from it. Actually, uh, they imploded. Uh, if you don't know, Rome started the first welfare system. They thought more about the games. They were lovers of pleasure more than they were lovers of God. They started hiring mercenaries to fight instead of having the Roman legions that conquered the world. They began to get weaker and weaker on the inside, attacked from the outside until actually they were overrun. But now we're talking about a religious system. By the way, that political system is, is getting back up again. But if you notice what he said in verse number 41... He said, and whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes? What happened was this iron went down into two legs. Now, if you take historically what happened, and I, for, I always forget the date. I think it's 1052 A.D. or 1054 A.D. You had what's called the schism of 1054 A.D. What happened was this religious system that was still alive, hey, they gave their power to Constantine. The beginnings of your in Roman Catholic Church, and by the way, the key word is Roman, that began in 325 AD at what's called the Council of Nicaea. That's about the time you've got all of these, uh, these uh, documents and everything are dated back to that particular time. But at the same time, Constantine, they, they gave their power to him. They had power with him. When that fell, the Roman Empire church-wise continued but what they did, they broke into two divisions. You had one uh, a pope in, in Rome, and then you had one in Constantinople. They hated each other. They were struggling for the power of the Roman church. So what happened was the one in Rome excommunicated the church at Constantinople. The Constantinople pope uh, anathematized the one at Rome, so you had the break of the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church. They're virtually the same other than their priesthood as the Greek Orthodox wear beards, they're able to marry. They're the same thing. That's, that was the two legs that broke out of it. But he talked about the fourth kingdom strong as iron. Verse number 41, he talked about that the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. Even though they were divided, that iron's still there. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Clay in the Bible is a type of manhood or mankind. So what happened to this religious system as it came down, it could no longer rule over people the way it used to do. There were times, and we'll get into that, to where they killed everybody that raised their tongue against it. They destroyed their lives. If you go in third world countries, you see the power of that end time religion now. They hold these people in absolute fear. They are scared to death of what they've got. But what happened is in these countries, the religion had to mingle with the people itself. Now, what does this end time system do? It, it will accept their spiritism. If you go out to the Indians... They, they've got uh, uh, monks out there. They've got monasteries out there. And they will let these Indians have their sun dance, their days of the dead. They'll let them do that down in Mexico. They'll let that tie that in, but they still they control the religion itself. That's what he's talking about, this mixing that it was. In verse number 42, he said, So the, as the toes of the feet were part iron, part clay, so shall the kingdom shall be partly strong, but partly broken. Look at verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with the miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to the other. Even though they're mingled, they're still separated even as iron is not mixed with clay. Look in verse number 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Verse 45. For as much as thou sawest the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. 
that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And he talked about this dream is certain in the invitation thereof. Now, I want to just stop with this. Let's go back to Mystery Babylon. Why is it a mystery? Because people don't understand what it's doing. Folks, they're deceived today. They believe that Roman Catholicism is a good religion to have around and people to have a part of that. Folks, this is what he's talking about. And when you get to chapter number 17, we find what God said about one. God called this end time religion the great whore. But then he calls it Mystery Babylon the Great because of its beginnings it comes all the way through. What is the main thing you find in every false religion on earth? You find idolatry. They're labeled with idolatry. They've got idols. I don't care if you go to the islands. I don't care if you go to the jungles. I don't care where you go. You're going to find that what they worship is idolatry. We're going to deal with that when we get to the mother of harlots. But what has happened is, is this system today has mingled with the people to the point that it's put on a good face. I remember years ago, when I first came to Greenville, 1983. There was a little piece in the Greenville News about this long, way back toward the back part of the news. I didn't have a lot to do. I was starting a new business, didn't have a lot of people. And so I was reading the Greenville News, and I read, and it talked about the election of the black pope. Anybody ever heard of the black pope? The black pope is the one who headed up the Inquisition. This is your Jesuit priesthood. That's separated from the priesthood that you find normally in these churches. You have what's called the Jesuit. Did you know we have Jesuit priest schools all over America today? Marquette. Boy, you can go through them. What's that? When's all the basketball games now out west? Can't think of their name. Listen, these are Jesuit schools. They train Jesuit priests. These are the most formidable of the priests. These are the ones that headed up the inquisitions in Spain and other places. And they still have that function, that part of Roman Catholicism is alive today just like it was a long time ago when they put a lot of Christians to death. And we're going to look at that. But I want to say that people are deceived about that thing tonight. Listen, don't let it deceive you. Roman Catholicism is not Christian. When I was a boy, if you ask a Roman Catholic, are you a Christian? His automatic response would be to say, no, I'm a Catholic. He knew the difference. But today, the deception is that nobody knows the difference. And that's where we are. That is Babylon the Great. Amen. Let's stand tonight and we're going to have an invitation. Trying to, not to get too historically involved in that. Boy, you can, you can teach history classes uh, off of these. But we need to understand tonight who and what this system is. Now, the people that are in it, if somebody's listening, you're in that tonight, you need to read the Bible. You don't know 